A man of Song, who sold ceremonial hats, made a trip to Yue, but the Yue people cut their hair short and tattoo their bodies, and had no use for such things. Thus spoke the ancient Taoist philosopher Zhuangzi in the 4th century BC in what is today northern China. Though most people are familiar with Zhuangzi's memorable butterfly conundrum, had he dreamt of being a butterfly, or had a butterfly dreamt of being him, his tale of a hatter from Song is a more apt analogy for this episode. The lesson is simple. When the customs or culture of one place differ from those of another, practices that are familiar in the first will be regarded as unfamiliar in the second. Zhuangzi may just as well have been speaking about the market for antiquities in the Middle East prior to World War I, where a widespread perception of cultural disconnect between living and dead gave Europeans the opening they needed to remove untold treasures abroad. China would be different. For the first time, Westerners came face to face with a cultured elite whose degree of education and obsession with antiquity far exceeded their own. In China, the highly educated Confucian elite had been studying, collecting, appreciating, and preserving their own art and antiquities for thousands of years, long before the first Western scholar ever set foot in their land. Furthermore, unlike the Europeans, they didn't have to rediscover their classical heritage during a Chinese renaissance. For in China, the Confucian elite subscribed to an ideal of unbroken cultural continuity with their ancestors as far back as the historical record took them. We call this the perception of cultural continuity. This was the world into which stepped the historical Indiana Jones. Of course, long before they arrived in China, Europeans were already familiar with one particular form of Chinese art, porcelain. As early as the 18th century, with the arrival of Dutch and British merchant vessels in East Asia, the Chinese had begun to produce porcelain designed specifically for the European market, giving rise to an entire fashion craze known as chinoiserie. But these motifs reflected European tastes, not Chinese. As a result, neither side yet coveted what the other possessed. This began to change in 1860, when the Second Opium War witnessed the invasion of British and French armies into Beijing. At long last, the British and French managed to grab hold of the same sort of aesthetic wares the Chinese themselves valued, as opposed to the exported motifs of chinoiserie. Much of the loot was subsequently auctioned off in Beijing, and soon found its way into the international art market. Over the next several decades, Westerners began to appreciate and covet the same sort of art that the Chinese themselves cherished. Bronzes, steelies, calligraphy, and paintings. But how would they obtain these objects? Unlike in the Ottoman Empire, the bulk of antiquities in China were not simply languishing under the midday sun. Rather, they were lovingly tended by their Chinese owners, locked away in storage until the arrival of an honored guest justified their display. The Westerner in China found it nearly impossible to gain access to these private collections. All existing channels of acquisition were dominated by Confucian and Japanese connoisseurs, both of whom perceived the entirety of China's 3,000 years of recorded history as worthy of acquisition. It soon became clear that if Western collectors wanted to fill their museums with Chinese art, they would have to tap into a new supply of antiquities. Prior to the 1911 revolution, there was only one way for a Western collector to get the better of his East Asian rivals. Dig for it himself. Only through the yields of freshly excavated sites could the Westerner hope to compete with his Chinese counterparts. Such sites were of three sorts, tombs, oracle bones, and the desiccated treasures of the Silk Road which will be treated in episode 14. Much as in Egypt, in China, the lavish graves of the rich and powerful had been dug into by peasants since time immemorial. Unlike in Egypt, however, even if tombs in China yielded nothing of intrinsic value, that is, precious metals, jade, and jewelry, they still offered the promise of financial compensation. This is because the Confucian elites, inspired by the perception of cultural continuity, infused value into almost any artistic or literary production from antiquity, 
and were willing to pay good money for them. What changed in the early 20th century was the appearance of a new customer in China, one with deep pockets and nowhere to spend it. With Western demand for Chinese antiquities now far outstripping the available supply, the proprietors of antique and curio shops began to send their purchasing agents directly into the field. In the process, they stimulated a new tomb raiding craze in China that continues to this day. One of the first beneficiaries of this craze was the Western Museum. Western collectors also found themselves well positioned to exploit another collection of newly available artifacts, oracle bones. In 1899, after a major flood, a tiny village nestled along a tributary of the Yellow River began to produce an unusually large supply of what were known locally as dragon bones. These bones, mostly turtle shells and ox scapula, were highly sought after by Chinese pharmacists and apothecaries, who crushed them into a powder and inserted the auspicious particles into various medicinal concoctions. Fan Wei Ching, an antiquities dealer from Shandong who was then passing through the area in search of more valuable bronzes, came across the bones and noted traces of what appeared to be some form of writing on the surface. So we bought several batches of them and took them north to Tianjin to see if any Chinese scholars would buy them. Several did, and the oracle bone business was born. After several years of intense study, Chinese scholars concluded that the faint etchings on bone were the earliest form of the Chinese script yet recovered, dating back to 1250 BC. From that point forward, collectors on all sides clamored for a piece of the pie. The antiquities dealer Fan Wei Ching tried to conceal the location of the village for as long as he could, but the secret eventually proved too good to keep. Local landlords fought over excavation rights to their fields, while peasants scuffled with their neighbors, each hoping to control the supply of bones to wealthy scholars in the cities, both Chinese and foreigner alike. The first Westerners to exploit the oracle bone market were Samuel Cooling and Frank Chalfant, American and British missionaries living in Shandong province. Together, they managed to collect several thousand pieces. In the end, Tens of thousands of oracle bone fragments would end up in the collections of foreign scholars, diplomats, and missionaries, most of who later donated or resold their bones to Western museums and universities. For the first time, tomb raiders and oracle bone dealers had enabled Western collectors to claim a seat at the table of Chinese antiquities. But it was still just one seat among many, and the elbows of rival Chinese and Japanese collectors ensured the limits of their reach. Apparently, if China was to yield its treasures as the Ottoman Empire had once done, it would only do so under similarly compromising conditions, political instability and a perception of cultural discontinuity. With the overthrow of the Qing Dynasty in 1911, the political instability finally arrived, and the empire quickly dissolved into a patchwork quilt of competing warlord domains. For the next 40 years, War and suffering were constant features of daily life throughout the land. Such chaos reverberated throughout the world of art and antiquities. Within months of the revolution, thousands of former Qing officials found themselves unemployed. In the face of such hardship, even the most treasured works of art were finally put up for sale. John Ferguson, a Canadian missionary with Chinese friends in high places, was one of the best positioned to exploit the sudden glut of antiquities. In 1914, the family of an official who was assassinated during the revolution contacted Ferguson to discuss a sale. The family, Ferguson wrote, has been left with not much else than the art specimens which the father collected during his life. That same year, Ferguson noted that, quote, the market here has never been so favorable as at present. The reason, he concluded, was due to the necessity of selling collections on the part of those who are no longer in office. It has nearly driven me to bankruptcy to try and buy as much as I have. The next major casualty of the new political instability was public religious art. Prior to the revolution, public installations of Taoist and Buddhist art had generally been kept free of vandalism. With hunger and warfare endemic throughout the land, however, even sites of active religious worship could now be targeted for sale. In 
The tragic results were on prominent display at the Longmun Grottoes near Luoyang. The more than 2,000 caves, carved out of a side of a limestone cliff spanning more than half a mile, contained tens of thousands of Buddhist statues, inscriptions, and steles. Most could be dated from the 4th to the 10th centuries, having survived intact for more than a millennium. But now, they were sitting ducks. Men from across the river wade armpit deep in the river and chip fragments from the surface at night, one collector observed. These they took down to Zhengzhou, where agents of the Beijing dealers bought them. In Beijing, the fragments were assembled, and with zeal, copies were made from photographs and rubbings. Western collectors were more than happy to fuel this illicit trade by paying top dollar for anything that reached the city. C.T. Lu, one of the more successful Chinese antiquities dealers, made a fortune exporting vandalized sculptures and art from Longmen and countless other sites to Western museums and dealers throughout the world. In 1934, long after Longmen had been stripped of its most exquisite treasures, Edward Forbes, the director of the Fogg Art Museum at Harvard, attempted to justify the acquisition of so much dubious loot. I think that it is an outrage that the Chinese government should have allowed these great sculptures to be hacked off the walls of the cave and to leave the country, he said. But I think as we had nothing to do with hacking them off the walls of the cave, and first heard of them when the mutilated pieces were in Beijing being put together, we are justified in buying them for posterity in this way, even if to accomplish the object of preserving them, we have to divide the sculpture into two halves. What was to be done about all this? For the time being, nothing. Laws prohibiting this sort of activity were already on the books and had been for some time. But until political stability returned to China, there was simply no way to enforce the law throughout the realm. Unfortunately, the Chinese people had a long wait ahead of them. First the Western empires, and later the Japanese, made sure of that. No matter how bad the situation got, however, there was one thing the Chinese were determined to hold on to at all costs. Please join us next time as we explore the treasures of the Forbidden City in Episode 13 of Indiana Jones in History.